was thinking a lot, just to get started, and I was thinking a lot about our discussion yesterday regarding politics. And, you know, I realize it's very easy to, well, it's very easy to be puzzled where I'm coming from in some of those statements. Um, and I, I just wanted to underscore that one of the things I'm trying to talk about, because I, I remember in my mind someone said, well, are you criticizing Butler and Zizek? No. And I didn't, I didn't want to give that idea. This wasn't, a, I wasn't making critical remarks. Um, what I was saying is that any time we think about being um, acting publicly as intellectuals, and I'm thinking about what the status of the intellectual is, um, you know, any kind of public engagement requires an engagement with the public itself, in the sense of uh, not just the individuals, but the, the public in the sense of the space, the, the, and the organization of that space, or the scene in which one is working. And, um, and I was trying to suggest that one has to really think about uh, the structure of representation and, and how, in some sense, being political in the academy means representing oneself in a certain way and representing oneself in relation to structures of, of recognition. Um, I mean, identity politics is about seeking recognition. I mean, you know, recognition is a, is a very powerful uh, construction. Take it back to Hegel if you want, um, and the, the master-slave dialectic and you know, all of this you know, structure of recognition is, um, implies a very great deal about how one uh, constructs oneself and how, and how, identi how identity is determined. So I'm basically suggesting that uh, I, I think to be political means to challenge that structure and, uh, and then to create communities, create movements, create events that in some way um, unsettle that structure, because that structure is very powerfully undergirded you know, by the interests of capital and you know, various political interests. There's a passage in, uh, uh, I wish I had it with me, um, a passage in Blanchot. Blanchot once um, was asked in 19, uh, gosh, it must have been about, 1984, uh, Catherine David for the Nouvel Observateur asked, I sent out a questionnaire and she said to various people, what do you think about the notion of engagement? Do you consider yourself an en uh, engagement, uh, which is usually translated as committed or commitment? Uh, do you think of yourself as a committed writer? And uh, Blanchot wrote back and, you know, it's almost a, you, you can't help but recognize his humor if you know Blanchot. He says, oh. Engagement, but well, that takes me back. Um, <laughs> and basically he's saying, that takes me back to my relation to Centre, which is, was a very difficult relation. Um, they, they worked together, but at the same time he had a very different idea of engagement from, from Centre. And, uh, and he says, yes, that took me back uh, 30 years when all of us, all of us, even Sartre himself, became irritated with that um, simplistic formula. <laughs> so, but, but he says, but if you really want to think about engagement, uh, you need to look back at some of the... Um, some, some, well, you should look at. He suggests you look at a number of different, look at a number of different ways. But we can go all the way back to, uh, to texts that that come from a time before literature, um, and for the one that is perhaps closest to us, we might look to the um, to what's called in Christian circles the Old Testament. So, and then he starts talking about Exodus, and, and he says, if you want to think about um, an engaged literature, here is an engaged literature, and he starts talking about the idea of going out and uh, exile. And in this passage to the outside that, that is recounted in, in Exodus. And he tries to, he tries to um, remind us once again, you know, as, as in, in the uh, Jewish Pesach, you, you, you remember we were all once slaves. And we must remember this passage from Egypt. We must remember that we are slaves always. And we have to enact this passage, this, this, this Exodus. And, um, and so he's, he's, you know, there's, there's is, is an engaged literature. Um, and for Blanchot, he is always, uh, I'm not quite sure how I jumped suddenly into Blanchot, but I'm going to continue. Blanchot is always struggling with the, the question of how to balance a form of thinking and writing which escapes the how can I say, escapes the structure of the dialectic and escapes a mobilization of power um, in favor of a relation which is, involves for him a kind of powerlessness, a 
um, a kind of a, a kind of radical exposure to the outside, which is without a, a determining or uh, positing uh, relation to the outside. <coughs> so he's struggling with the um, with a dual imperative, and he, and he comes back to this over and over again in his writing. Right? Um, he is he was throughout his life he has what he describes in one one letter as a uh, he, has a he has a passion for the political and if you know his history that passion started out led him to be led him to the extreme right wing he, he was um, he was friends with Levinas in the twenties um, and Levinas was asked later on well did you share political views and Levinas laughed and said my dear sir Blanchot was a monarchist um, and, you know, <laughs> And that, those kinds of evidence, his Catholic, uh, um, his Catholic upbringing and commitments, his, his relation to French nation and culture and so forth, he, he, was a, he was a monarchist with a Catholic background in the 20s and 30s. And that led him to, into the extreme right wing, uh, into uh, collaborating with, um, as a journalist with uh, people in the extreme right. Um, around the... Uh, Shortly before the war, it's, it, it's clear he, he began to rethink his positions, and he himself described a kind of conversion which happened in the course of the war. And we can situate that in relation to um, dialogues or conversations he had with Bataille. Um, that's one way of situating it. It's very, it's very difficult to situate because he, well before the war, Blanchot was writing things that just were not compatible with any kind of uh, nationalist um, uh, commitment. Um, his, his book, Thomas the Obscure, was, was, he started it during, in, it was, was being written over the decade before the war. So um, it was a very complex um, stance that he was taking. But he nevertheless, he, said, he himself said that he underwent a kind of conversion in, in the course of the war. And he come, came out of the, this period on the, on the left. And as he continued, this thinking, writing, practice and thinking about the meaning of literature in relation to the political and so forth, he, he really came to, uh, to occupy a position um, to the left of left, if you will, um, you know, to uh, an extreme gauche, I mean, a, 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 very, a very radical um, left, which pretty much found its expression, if you can use that word, in, in the events of 68. I mean, when, when 68 occurred, Blanchot felt in, uh, utterly... Um, well, he was ecstatic, and this is what he'd been waiting for in some sense, and this is in a way what he'd been writing for the, for the decades preceding. But, <clears throat> so Blanchot always had this political passion, um, you know, whether it was on the right or whether it was on the left, he, he felt it, it intensely engaged with you know, the question of the political. And you, you, you can see concepts that, that work from the very earliest through the very latest period, and one of these is the notion of refusal. Um, uh, sort of uh, um, categorical no, <laughs> which which he uh, offers to the powers that he resists. Um, but refusal is not simply negation; um, it's something that exceeds negation. And so, so Blanchot is trying to occupy um, at one and the same time a political position in the sense of acting in relation to political events. And in the post-war period, this, this sort of becomes focalized around a struggle against de Gaulle and the Algerian War, and then increasingly other situations leading up to 68. Uh, so he's preoccupied with, with precise political issues, and at the same time trying to engage a writing and thinking practice which requires, um, requires a kind of departure from the terms of political debate. Um, as established in, largely in the, in the, in the Marxist context of French post-war thinking. <clears throat> so Blanchot tried to articulate the, the imperative of a, of a double stance or a double position. And this is something you'll see in Derrida, he, he writes about this sometimes. <coughs> and I think he's taking it from Blanchot, he's very much informed by Blanchot. A double, a sort of a double imperative, a double exigency of fighting for justice, or fighting for political causes in very uh, concrete, precise terms. And Blanchot was willing to put a lot of work into this. I mean, he was you know, very concerted in his um, commitments. Um, and very precise, you know, very, very um, 
concrete. But at the same time, he was attempting to, um, to engage another relation to the political, um, and, uh, and a relation that would sometimes exceed what we might understand as the political order, which is where I was speaking from a bit yesterday. And that's where he situates what he calls friendship and community. So, you'll see this through the, um, well, it, it, start, it, it appears in the 40s, and there's a letter to Bataille that's very famous in this respect, um, 50s, 60s, and 70s. He's talking about this double stance, um, the necessity of being political in, a, in an established sense, and then a different kind of um, writing or a different stance. But I, my, my, my hypothesis is that Blanchot was trying to, trying to find a way to think these together. And so, um, if I switch terms just a little bit, uh, we can find a similar problem in Levinas. And uh, Levinas uh, was <coughs> concerned primarily with the relation between um, the self and the other, which he, and the other he used the term outrui. The other is the other is the represents a presence of. Uh, 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 well, it's a non-determinable presence. It's, it's a, I, I knew you had a question. No, it's okay. It's a, a non-determinable presence, a, 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 the presence of an infinite alterity. And so the question that Levinas is trying to think of is, is uh, how, how can one honor that alterity, open to that alterity, and, um, and remain open to it? And Levinas is a whole host of concepts of thinking about this vulnerability, substitution, you know, a number of different ways, but, but it's this, the problem is this relation between self and other, which does not in any way um, determine the alterity of the other, but opens to that infinite alterity. A political relation has to determine to some extent, right? So the, uh, the relation that Levinas is talking about has to exceed a, a political relation. But at the same time, Levinas says that any time we relate to the, um, to the other in this respect, we are also referred to the other of the other. We're, we're referred to a third. And in that, in that reference, there opens the question of justice. Um, the, uh, and so immediately it's a question of justice and it's a question of mediation. Um, how, how can one relate to the other and their relation to the other in a just manner? And there we, en we enter questions of equity and, and justice in a, in, a, in a more traditional sense. And we enter the, the realm of politics. Um, politics and law and, and, uh, and, and equity, e equality, and so forth. For Levinas, this is an immense problem um, because it, 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 it means thinking about the, the relation between self and other, and the, and the you might say, the linguistic relation. And linguistic is really a bad word there, but the, this opening of other to self is one of a. a, a it, it, Levinas describes it as a, happening in a saying, um, and there's also a the, you know, the, the, the face, the, the, the visage, um, is, is understood as a kind of sign in, in, in living us. But it's a sign that is not signifying in, in a sense of, of um, a signifier-signified relation. Um, and the relation then to the third, the relation of justice um, in that mediated sense, requires a different kind of linguistic um, usage. So the problem is thinking together ethics, which is the relation to the other, and, the, and justice, which is the relation to the, to the third. So the, the two stances that I was referring to in Blanchot, one is the one of, you know, sort of concrete political stance, and then the other is one of um, trying to think another relation um, than, than that political one. Those two are mirrored in Levinas with the, with the ethical relation and the relation to justice. And the issue is how to, um, in some sense, how to, how to think these together. Um, at some level, Bosch was very explicit, he says there's an incompatibility here, that, or an incommensurability, they can't be brought together. But my, my reading of Blanchot leads me to think that what Blanchot was seeking is a way to orient the one, let's say justice, the one of the mediation, the relation of the third, how to orient that in relation to the, to the, to the first, the ethical relation. So how to think justice from the ethical is, is, is uh, Blanchot's question. Um, now this is a very, uh, you know, I have to, to show this in the text, it really takes an awful lot of work. Um, and, it, and it starts to 
come clear to me a bit in the, in the book La Pat uh, And I wish I could could lay that out for you, but it really is uh, it, it takes quite a quite a quite a quite a labor. I will on Sunday night. I guess that's the one. No, it's on the ninth. I'll, I'll give when I give my public presentation. I'll, I'll address this question um, in, in my, my essay. But Blanchot is trying to, um, as I say, he's trying to think the one from the other. And in that sense, it's almost as though he's trying to. Whereas you know, Levinas is talking about a kind of balancing, or he talks about the you know maintaining <coughs> incommensurable, incompatible uh, stances. He he starts to. He starts to try to think how to turn one in relation to the other. So, and, and part of, I think, the notion of conversion is making that turn. So that's, um, in, in a way, that's, what, that's part of where I'm speaking from when I talk about trying to, to, to find a different stance in, 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 a, in a political context. Um, but it's in the back of my mind. And part of the sentence says, um, on the one side, solidarity, on the other, hospitality. And the threshold is there. Hospitality is the relation to the other. Solidarity is the political relation. And you, and you can't quite do without either. Um, Which was but you must. I'm sorry? Which was more important for Blanchot? The, the ethical or the just? Well, I mean, just you see, in a sense, when he, th when he decides you must maintain both, you, he would say they are equally important. But one, doesn't one kind of interpret the other like, is justice ethical or is ethics? Well, <laughs> no, in a certain sense, I mean, no, they're, they're incommensurable, incompatible. But I think that at a certain point he starts to try to think the one from the other. Yeah, that's what that's what I'm saying. So it is then, it's the hospitality that, that takes over, so to speak. So that becomes dominant. Yeah. Yes. And uh, dominant or orienting. I mean, that's yeah, orienting, word. yeah, yeah. I, I don't think like dominant because it's not, it's not a matter of, of solving a contradiction or uh, you know, a resolution or, or a finally preferring one. It's a matter of really of turning in a certain way and orienting. <coughs> um, but it's 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 to the hospitality side. Okay, well, um, just those thoughts. Too. We can we can perhaps find a way to come back. But I wanted to share this process a little bit. We were looking at the three concepts for the thing last time, and I'm avoiding my usual development of this in relation to uh, Goldilocks and the Three Bears. But, um, <laughs> we come to the third one. Because, see, I don't repeat myself every time. Okay. <clears throat> um, we come to the third one. <clears throat> the first one, I think I said, the first one takes us too far away from the thing. Um, takes us too far away from our, our relation to the presence of the thing. The second one um, conceives the thing as invading us or overwhelming us with this uh, insensibility. Remember, I just, just recall. But the third one <coughs> seems, to, uh, seems to fit a little bit better. Um, neither too far nor too close. And it's certainly one that is easily recognized because this is the the matter-form relation. And so I'm on page 26 of this printout. And this is the third interpretation of the thing. It says, that which gives things their constancy and pith, but is also at the same time the source of their particular mode of sensuous pressure, colored, resonant, hard, massive, is the matter of things. In this analysis of the thing as matter, hule, in the Greek, which basically goes back to wood as I remember, form, morphe, is already propositive. What is constant in a thing, its consistency, lies in the fact that matter stands together with a form. The thing is formed matter. This interpretation appeals to the immediate view with which the thing solicits us by its looks, eidos. In this synthesis of matter and form, a thing concept has finally been found, which applies equally to things of nature and to use objects. Now, it seems, uh, in a certain sense, pretty straightforward. Uh, as I said, it's, it's almost impossible not to employ these concepts when one is um, talking about art or any 
created thing whatsoever. Um, but Heidegger wants to suggest that these concepts, first of all, he, as he goes forward, he will say these, these have a very specific provenance. Um, namely, that they come from a conception of the thing deriving from Greek uh, thinking, which thinks everything from the basis of production, of, a, of the subject's production of, a, um, of, 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 of equipment, as he puts it. Now, it, there's, a, there's a very interesting thing going on here, because um, what Heidegger will proceed to deconstruct as he addresses this matter-thing relation and this predominance of the way of thinking of the thing from the basis of equipment is precisely his own starting point in, um, in the 20s. He, in, the, in the basic problems of phenomenology from 1928, he basically adopts this point of view and, and says this notion of production, which the Greeks uh, put forward in thinking about how um, a piece of equipment is made, uh, in fact, has a universal applicability because the Greeks are, are grasping that in order to understand the thing, we must think, we must think it from the subject's relation to the thing, and we must think it from that process of production, herstellung, that is um, that characterizes the um, the making of equipment, and so the the Greek notion of essence, usia, uh, which goes back to a notion of property. Um, and that which is proper to the, uh, to the household in a certain sense. Um, all of that, he says, is, can, can appropriately orient our understanding of the relation to things. Um, and the Greeks, he says, think mere things, as you know, mere physical things, as he describes at the beginning of the text, um, in relation to equipment. And the same thing for, for you know, well, nature, he says, is, is thought in relation to equipment. And he more or less adopts that point of view. He, and he says, and the reason that is so, um, so acceptable is, is that the Greeks are recognizing that in all relationality we must take into account the subject. They don't do it sufficiently, he says. They don't take the agent into account sufficiently, and, and that allows for his, his task of, of developing this thinking. But he accepts it as a, you know, as a sort of a grounding starting point for thinking about the, the thing and, and being. So this is all in the opening pages of the Basic Problems of Phenomenology, and I recommend that to you very strongly. Um, but as he will tell us here, this notion of production, this notion of Heshtel, uh, which gives us matter and form, among other concepts, for thinking about the constitution of the thing, actually blocks our relation to the thing. Um, this notion of production is, is uh, sort of forecloses dimensions of the of the thingness, or the thinghood of the thing. And I, I mentioned this yesterday, but I'll, I'll just mention it again. It's really, if, do look at the basic problems of phenomenology, and look at the passage in which he cites Rilke. Um, there's a passage from the, from the notebooks um, in which uh, the, the narrator say, comes across the traces of his old uh, apartment, but which has been uh, eliminated. Um, the, the building is actually missing, and, and the traces are on the facade of the uh, adjoining building, and what you have are stains, basically the stains of, of, of lives lived there for many generations, um, the, the, the mark of the, the sink um, and, and on the water there, and the leakage, the mark of the toilet, the, 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 you know, the traces of wallpaper, yellowed wallpaper, or you know, other colors that are less definable and so forth, but it's all the, uh, you know, all the, all the all the, in a certain sense, all the waste products um, are traces of, of, of sort of human habitation, but in the sense of what's left over, right? And, uh, and uh, the narrator um, looks at this and, and he describes it in a long page, and then says, um, "What I'm describing to you happened instantaneously. I, I recognized, um, you know, I, I recognized the uncanny presence of the home." And so, which he'd been carrying in him. So this uncanniness that said he'd been carrying in him suddenly is, it was a certain sense, written on the wall, and, 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 he, and he runs instantaneously in an experience of angst, and his anguish. So he's, he recognizes his, uh, his unheimlich being, you know, in relation to this, uh, to this house. And, and Heidegger says, there it is. This is exactly what I've been describing and trying and try to describe being in the world. This is, this is existence. But uh, basic problems of phenomenology don't give us the means to understand those traces of the 
residue of life. You know, that, 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 the, the, the text is, is strangely unable to read that passage, in, in my view. The, the, the conceptual apparatus isn't there. It is there once he brings in the notion of the earth and um, this, this, uh, you know, this, this opacity that he uh, links to things and the human relation to that opacity. But in the, um, in the basic problems of phenomenology, when he's thinking from a notion of Herstellung, and in relation to equipment, when he's thinking Greekly in that way, he doesn't have the means to think that precisely that dimension of human existence, which is this, which is the uncanniness of, uh, of the human. So it's uh, it, it's it's fascinating, and and um, in, in that respect, Heidegger is in part performing a kind of auto critique. Here. Um, he is uh, he's, he's he's showing the limits of that thinking of production, Herstellung, that he had been working with in, uh, in the 20s. And he's also in this process, he's deconstructing the, um, some of these metaphysical um, suppositions um, that, you know, relating, to the, relating to the subject in particular and the subject's productive capacity, its capacity to produce before itself the, the, the piece of equipment. So this, is, this deconstruction of the founding concepts of aesthetics is also a deconstruction of um, his understanding of the relation to, to being um, in, in, some, in some measure. So he, he, does, he, he tells us very clearly, very immediately, that um, you know, what's at stake. So I'm going to um, just continue reading and, and comment. This concept puts us in a position to answer the question concerning the thingly element of the work of art. The thingly element is manifestly the matter of which it consists. Matter is the substrate and field for the artist's formative action. But we could have advanced this obvious and well-known definition of the thingly element at the outset. Why do we make a detour through with other current thing concepts? Because we also mistrust this concept of a thing, which represents it as, excuse me, as formed matter. But is not precisely this pair of concepts, matter form usually employed in the domain in which we are supposed to be moving. To be sure, the distinction of matter and form is the conceptual scheme which is used in the greatest variety of ways, quite generally, for all art theory and aesthetics. This incontestable fact, however, proves neither that the distinction of matter and form is adequately founded, nor that it belongs originally to the domain of art and artwork. In the artwork. Moreover, the range of application of this pair of concepts has long extended far beyond the field of aesthetics. Form and content are the most hackneyed concepts under which anything and everything may be subsumed. And if form is correlated with the rational and matter with the irrational, if the rational is taken to, the to be the logical and irrational the illogical, if in addition the subject-object relation is coupled with the conceptual pair form-matter, then representation has at its command a conceptual machinery that nothing is capable of withstanding. It's quite a statement. Uh, we could ask, we could add masculine and feminine to that set of binary oppositions. I mean, it's uh, you know, it's, it's it, 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 these are some of the core binary distinctions in metaphysics, as, as deconstruction would, would give them to us. And he's, uh, so, and this is, you know, I, I said yesterday that what is what is Heidegger attacking in aesthetics? And we were talking about the Erlebnis Erfahrung relation. Um, and I, you know, certainly he is trying to move us toward the thought of Erfahrung in, in relation to the experience of art. Um, but I think in, in, in relation to his effort to, um, you know, to address aesthetics, here is the core issue. Um, it's this relation of matter and thing as it's conceived within the, the metaphysical tradition. And as it works from the beginning, in metaphysics, from the Greek notion of production as Hashtag, um, through this uh, to this later form of aesthetics. I'm emphasizing this word production, Hashtag, because you'll see it come back in this text. But you'll notice that it is um, it is employed in a, in a rather peculiar way. Um, when he talks about setting setting up the world in the artwork um, and uh, defining or, or, or elaborating the defining measure that, that a world um, entails. He doesn't use the word production. Um, he uses the word um, uh, 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 it's, it's Aufstellen. It's, it's more a setting up at that point. 
He uses. He also uses errichten, but but aufstellen is the is the is the verb that he uses there. Herstellen is the word he reserves for for setting forth the earth in this process of of poetic uh, in this poiesis, in this poetic uh, creation. So he it says he displaces the word herstellen in this text in order to attend to the way in which the earth is used by the artist and in a very peculiar way that the earth is is. Uh, is engaged in in the um, artistic creation. So Heschelung, there's a there's a kind of um, as I say there there is a kind of uh, deconstruction of aesthetics going on, but it's a deconstruction of metaphysics more uh, more generally. Insofar as he's trying to attack the notion of production itself. So that's why the question of work becomes so important. Right? We're, we're talking about the the working of the artwork and the reality. Um, the Wirklichkeit of the Werk. Um, all of this is, a, is an effort to try to rethink the notion of production in order to escape the metaphysics of subjectivity, or not to escape it, but to dislodge it, to allow a, a, a different thought of relation. Production, of course, you know, this is, you think about Hegel, the labor of the negative, you think about Marx, the, the, the laborer, the, the work of the proletariat. Um, you know, this, this notion of, of labor, um, of work, of production is, uh, you know, is absolutely central to, to modern, modern thought of the human relation to being and the, and the, 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 the creation of something like a, a world, a human world. And so this is, these are you know, the, the, the fundamental issues, once again, as we were saying yesterday, these are fundamental issues that are being, uh, being addressed in this text. And it is, again, it's a philosophical text, you know, first of all. Art is uh, an absolutely essential site for reasons that we were starting to discuss yesterday and we'll continue to discuss, but um, in a certain sense, the, 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 the biggest issues are being played out here as he's trying to think of the event of truth in art. Um, yeah? I was wondering, is he trying to dislodge the metaphysics of subjectivity because there's something more than just the, the, because there's something excessive, you know, because there's truth actually passing through the subject, and if you were to acknowledge the subject as such, then it couldn't be higher than the subject, or there couldn't be something sort of. Yeah, I mean, if I've understood your question, I mean, it just as, as I said here like a moment ago, the problem is that the notion of production blocks access yeah. to other dimensions of, you know, the relation to being that he's trying to think. Um, and, and in this text, he's trying to bring forth how this notion of production blocks, blocks access to the, to the thing, and, and, and to things, and to the earth, which is, he's trying to assert, is absolutely fundamental to truth itself. So what's, again, what's at stake is, is the nature of truth, truth's happening, and our relation to truth, and, and, you know, and what may or may not be occluded in, 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 in our construction of that. Did you want to ask that question before? Um, I'm I, sorry, I didn't. No, I didn't you've answered it. I was, on a, I was on a run, so I didn't. Excuse me. I'm just going to close this. So, matter and form then. Um, now, one of the questions, I said that, uh, you know, the big question opens here for us. <coughs> And you think about it in the most immediate sense. How do you talk about art without talking about form, <coughs> or without talking about matter? I mean, that's uh, <coughs> that's a rather formidable challenge. <coughs> Excuse me. And they. <coughs> yeah. Sure. I, I'm just with regards to what you were saying a second ago about um, escaping these these kinds of dualities to get to the nature of truth. You said mm -hmm. something along those lines. And yesterday we defined truth as in relation, um, it's something to do with concealment and revelation. And unconcealment. Right. It's not, it's not, a, not a kind of dichotomy. Concealment and unconcealment? Right. Um, That's what I meant yesterday when I asked about the, the, the kind of contingent nature of this definition of truth. It yeah. seems to have a kind of not a necessary. You see, I, I, and I was stumbling over your use of the word contingent. Uh, um, I mean, it's veiled. I mean, what is, I mean, what's under this book, you know, it's contingent on the, where the book is, that's what's going to be concealed. 
you know, ah. replaced here, so it is contingent on the concealment, not on what the what is revealed is contingent on how it's concealed. Yeah. <clears throat> You know, we're going to come back to this notion of concealment, and uh, uh, rather than jump ahead to that passage, because you're, you're really addressing something that he, he goes to quite directly here. Um, now, concealment is... Concealment is not continued. That's, you know, I, I, I was troubled by that word uh, yesterday, and I didn't quite know how to, how to answer it. It's not contingent in that this, this movement of opening or uh, clearing or lighting, he, he used these words all together. Light is the most problematic word perhaps because of its very metaphysically charged character in relation to platonic metaphysics. <coughs> but clearing, um, unconcealing, lighting, um, and so forth. This is always, a, uh, for him, it's always a f function, so it's not contingent, it's necessary, always a function of a certain withdrawal or a certain retreat or um, or certain closing. So uh, you cannot have you cannot have unconcealing without concealing. That the lethe and aletheia is, is is essential or necessary in that sense. Um, it's a so it, there is um, you know you could say a certain duality here, but this is not um, it doesn't have this, this, the relation he's thinking does not have the the, the binary structure that is that, that, that he's describing here. Um, you cannot think concealment without unconcealment, and uh, and vice versa in in, um, in this in this account of truth. Now, for your uh, notion of contingency, he, talk, he does talk about that too. Um, but I think that in um, in relation to um, you know the, the fundamental issues about truth that he's trying to get at, and also the, the way in which there is a there is a there is an opacity in truth. Or there is always an uncanniness in the in the homely and so forth. Um, this is absolutely essential to, to what he's trying to think in, in this um, in this event by which we come to have a relation to things. There's there's always something unmastered, always something that, that w is withheld. And so um, you know when he when he talk, when he, he says of our relation to uh, he's, what he says of metaphysics, and metaphysics is forgets being. That in a sense that is what's characteristic of metaphysics. That's what that's what makes metaphysics happen. You know, a, a certain kind of forgetting of being. He says, but that's not a mistake that's been made. That's actually inherent to the way in which being is given in in, uh, in a particular epoch. And in every giving, there is a withdrawing. So uh, forgetting is not a human failing. It's it's actually something that is proper to being itself. And if that belongs to this movement that is describing as concealing and unconcealing. So, the, in a certain sense, we have to perform forgetting in a different way in order to have a different relation to, to being. And this is something that Blanchot picks up in a very, very powerful. So, beyond the binary, right? So, it's like you're thinking of this as like a limit concept, right? Is, it, is this kind of similar to what you were saying yesterday, um, whatever it was, about like, well, like language? Like, there's a limit in this term. Like, so it has concealing it, it has unconcealing it, but it's invisible remainder also, there's something un... Yeah. Un yes, um, well, this movement, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure how to articulate immediately this relation between language and, and concealing and unconcealing that we're talking about. Um, I mean, that would take us into a big discussion of language. But the, the, the fact that there is always concealment and unconcealing means that the, 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 the unconcealed is, is really is, is, is shadowed, or is there, there is always a sense of a, of, of a limit, that the, that the outside is present in some way, or, or marked. And um, so yes, it's, it, 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 the truth is limitrophe in that way, if you will. It's, you know, it, it does have, uh, as he says very explicitly, truth is untruth in this text. Um, truth is not wholly there as truth. There's, it's, it's always, in a certain sense, there in a limited sense. So, perhaps I answered your question that way. Um, so, the question I was, I was going to then raise here, or the question that is, is, presents itself, is how do we talk about art without reference to matter or form? Um, you, you might want to, as you go through the text, 
underline that the Times he uses the word form. He does use the word form in this day. Um, but he's inviting us to think about it differently. He, he wants us to, he moves toward the use of the word gestalt. Gestalt is very in, interesting, um, you know, that I'm sure everybody understands that word just from gestalt psychology and so forth. Um, gestalt is an interesting word for him, uh, again, for the reasons that I was pointing to yesterday. You hear the ge, right? The gathering. And in Stalt, there is Stahl, which is the root for Stellen, you know, the, uh, the Greek root for Stellen. So uh, it is uh, in Gestalt that Gestalt communicates with Gestell, which he described as the, uh, um, you know, the, the, the way of thinking about the peculiar composition of the work of art. Um, but that's, you know, this kind of etymological play doesn't help us all that much, ultimately, in trying to think about how the gestalt of the work, um, the way in which the composed, gathered uh, figure of the work works. It, it doesn't, doesn't tell us that much. Um, he does invite us to go back into the Greek sense of morphe, the idea of limit. And, um, and, and that is a, actually a very productive thing. I, I, I can't take that tack with you right now. but. Um, it's still, I think the question remains for us, if, if we're to think about this gathered or composed form, or form, this gathered or composed figure in the Gestalt, how do we think it in, an, you know, in a way that escapes this, 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 this binary construction that is, you know, that is sort of held together by the matter-form relation? Um, how can we talk about form in a way that is, is not... Um, is, is not caught up in this idea of uh, something impressed upon matter or something um, uh, that, that simply shapes matter. Um, as we go forward, I'm going to try to give you um, one way of thinking about that. My own um, hypothesis is that the answer is, is rhythm. That the, um, the composition of the artwork uh, constitutes a rhythmic configuration. And that's why the artwork is, 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 entails a kind of movement in repose. Um, but we'll, we'll need to, well, I need, I'll need to try to justify this a little bit more as we go forward. But it is, it's, um, as if this, is, this is my way of trying to account for this. But um, you might want to think about this much more. And, you know, it's just, as I said, the question of the human is a fundamental question for this text. Um, it's like a, like a loose thread, um, but it's you know it's, it's it's an extremely productive loose thread. You can tie it in different ways, you know, and, and I think in very important ways. Um, I, I would say the same with this question of form. How do you think about the form of the work of art if you uh, are faithful to what Heidegger is trying to say about the event that happens in art? Um, obviously, you don't have to accept everything here, but if, if you if you entertain this notion of an event happening in the art world and an event of the ontological order that Heidegger is describing, how can we think about the composition of of the work? How do we, how do we think about its its gestalt? If if it is to um, manifest, or if it is to bring into play, or for us to bring us into play in this event whereby truth is redefined, or there is a paradigm shift, as, as we were saying the other day. Uh, there you are. <laughs> uh, yes, you have a question there? Um, uh, yeah, question. Um, you mentioned to the question of the human and, and form. When he says a few pages back that the human is not a thing, he just sort of like puts that up there, and I, I, I just wonder about what your response would be to that. You know, he, he's, he's um, at that moment in the, in the text, he is... Um, it's kind of a toss-off uh, uh, phrase. He does that a lot. Um, but the question is still pertinent. What is the thingly character of the human being? Well, and I thought about yeah. it, like, when you say, you know, if you meet somebody, and you're like, oh, well, they were an odd one. Right? Yeah. Like, and it's like, there's a point where the person becomes a thing, you know, and it's not like, like this thing, Jeremy, here, because I know Jeremy, right? Or like maybe There's nothing out about Jeremy. There's a point in your head where you like, make it into this object, I guess, and then it's like, but I don't, I mean, like, I don't well, know. Well, 
No, I think it's a very good question, really, um, because uh, I've heard people be offended by it as well. We, we, we say a young girl is a thing, I mean, because she's not quite human yet. I mean, that's just like something right. slightly offensive with that phrase, but I don't think he means it. I, I think he's, 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 he's speaking about common parlance and, and passing through it. Um, the, um, but the, the question of the thing is, he, you know, it's kind of on the horizon of this text. Um, because it's, it, it's, I mean, this is, this is, this is a, this again is a fundamental question to which, which you can only approach at this point. He's saying the artwork gives us the means to approach the question of the thing. And, and the suggestion seems to be, it, it gives us that means through the notion of the earth. So the question then is, what is the earthly dimension of human being? In what sense is the, you know, is our bodily being, um, to be thought from this notion of an earthly or earthy existence. And um, that's where I was trying to uh, bring in yesterday the reference to Stimmung, um, the, the poetic Stimmung, which is a, a mood, tonality, feeling, um, you know, that the, the, the sort of the state of mind, not state of mind, really, but the, the affective state, if you will, in a, taking affect in a very strong sense. The affective state in which the artist works is one that he suggests that is in some kind of communication with what he calls the earth. So it is, it is a very earthly component of creation um, at, at work <coughs> here. And, and, and that is the, you know, that's the, that's the, that's the hint, you know, that we, what we, we would need to follow to address the question that you are, that you are raising. So it is, uh, yes, you would say that there is a thingly dimension to a human being, um, but he's being very reserved about how one could you know, define that, um, because the question of the thing is, is very much on the horizon of this text. You see what I'm saying? So what I'm trying to say is to get to that question, I would say that from this text, the first way to go is through the, the um, is issue of Stimmung and affect and the earthly dimension of bodily being. Um, how the theorization of dusting the thing. I'm sorry, I when Freud and Lacan talk about dusting the thing. Dusting? Dusting the thing. The thing. Oh, dusting, I'm sorry, yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think dust is really important, but I thought, wow, this is it. I, didn't, I missed that in Lacan. <laughs> I think it's one opposite so different. This, again, this eruptive thing, right, yeah. in, in the human, but it's interesting in relation to the question, like, is it, like, it is kind of earthly, like, the, yeah. this eruptive, this, I just curious. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure about the provenance of that, and, and I hesitate to answer. They, they are, um, well, Freud is certainly well before, um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm about to refer to Blanchot. <laughs> um, uh, again, Lacan was reading Blanchot very carefully, as much as he was reading Heidegger. And Blanchot uses the word thing in a way that's closer to what Lacan is um, um, doing with it. Lacan was also a fantastic reader of Heidegger. I, I think he was maybe one of the best readers of Heidegger in France. Um, a very, very sustained, very powerful reader of Heidegger. So, um, my answer would be yes, probably. <laughs> you know, the Lacan is, is this is this is a Heideggerian motif showing up in Lacan. But I hesitate to to to, to assert that too directly. That's being the thing. I, I mean, I, I'm I feel that I'm, I I haven't quite uh, mastered something there. I'm not sure where it's coming from, and I don't and I don't know it in Freud that, that well. So I I just don't I can't give you a better, I don't feel confident in my answer about the provenance of that word in Lacan. I just have a question about how, like, for example, since he uses Van, one of Van Gogh's paintings to make a philosophical point, I find it like extraordinarily difficult to think about pain, for example, without the concept of form. Um, mm -hmm. Because Vasily Kandinsky um, says that at bottom, an image can only ever be a combination of color and form. Mm -hmm. And I find that to be a very rigorous um, formula. Well, I mean, uh, if you go back into Kant, I mean, you find a similar sort of formulation in Kant. And yeah. um, 
Yes. Uh, how do you uh, how do you possibly uh, um, you know you think about the relation between foreground, background, um, composition? All of it seems to require a notion of form. But I think he's trying to invite us to think about how how the trace, or how the delimiting limit. He's trying to invite us to think about how that works somewhat differently. So, in a, in a way, I, I think you know with a lot of these kinds of deconstructive movements, it's not about getting rid of the word form, but it's about understanding how form works a little bit more. And so, I, I kind of, it's more about displacing these concepts, dislodging these concepts, rather than um, you know simply dismissing them. The difficulty always with language in, in, these, in this kind of, of effort is that it's, you know, it, these, these words have such baggage, uh, you know, and, and as soon as we employ them, we are, in some sense, being employed by them. Right? And so um, Heidegger is, is constantly in a struggle with, um, do I use the old word and try to re reform it, or do I try to create an entirely new word? And you, and you, you can almost read the history of his text as a history of a struggle with that question. Um, and so you have this text, which speaks in ways that are, for the most part, fairly I don't want to say standard, but, but you know, uh, any philosopher could pick up this text and, and understand it. He has other texts, he's writing other texts in this period where that's simply not the case. Mm -hmm. he's, he's using a kind of Heideggerian parlance, and he's, and he's trying to create words and, you know, refashion sentences in ways that, um, that are really not very, uh, you know, immediately legible or accessible to someone who's not working through with him. So, uh, there's a, you know, there's a, a, a variegated, a, use of language in his text, and it's in all turns around this question, because these words, he, he insists that these words are, um, you know, are weighted in, in, in very powerful ways, and you simply cannot deploy them without um, being, without engaging the tradition from your system. So, it is to some extent, yes, an effort to get past the word form, but I think more fundamentally it's about trying to use form differently, and, and trying to, uh, trying to dislodge its, its hold on us. As a um, as something that induces a, a, a construction of a relation between a subject apprehending a form in an object, which it, that subject has in some sense brought to that form through some form of schematism, speaking in a Kantian way, um, determining that form through the representation of that object, and so he's trying to deconstruct that representational structure of subject and object, um, form as posited. Uh, being for for that for that thing. So through rhythm, the form can change more often, or can be, be imposed less over matter. Yes, and it's and it's it's thinking a kind of a, a movement of matter, yeah. <laughs> um, as opposed to you know thinking of an imprinting. The imprinting of the form over matter to fix it. And sort of yeah. 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 Now again, you get to that question: How do we think about fixing? Right. Yeah. The issue of the the. the um, he said, you know, fixing in place. Remember in the, in the, um, in the addendum, he, he's, he's worried about this idea of fixing. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so, matter and form. Now he takes, a very, uh, he takes a very interesting tack in this text, because he starts out by saying, well, the matter-form relation is, presents us with a, a particular problem, because what's happened is that a concept employed in relation to, to a particular area of experience or, or, or um, activity, that is to say, the, the, the making of equipment, has been carried over into all other relations to, um, to being. So, in a certain sense, he's saying this is an inappropriate use of a concept from a particular domain in other domains. The, um, to some extent, he is saying, um, the matter form uh, construction is appropriate to talking about equipment, although he said that still it has its limits. Equipment is more complex, but still he says that uh, you know it, it comes from a particular domain and has been misapplied when we bring it to art. Art is not a piece of equipment, and and so the we need to we need to respect that um, impropriety of of the of, of the term, and he's concerned about the way in which this matter form relation then gets it gets. It's extended to everything in general. That, you know, everything, every. You know, because remember, this is one of the three concepts of the thing: all art, all all equipment, and so forth. Um, but then he, instead of saying, "All right, let's just try to 
shunt this aside and get toward what's appropriate to art. He says, because it is so dominant, because this is in a sense the, you know, the, the, the element in which we move, um, let's try to explore it a little bit more precisely. So he says, let's go into it rather than um, trying to push it aside. And so he says, let's look at equipment a little bit more precisely in order to gauge what's happening in this matter-form relation. And that takes us into this, um, this really quite extraordinary reading of the uh, Van Gogh's painting of the shoes. <coughs> Um, I've actually jumped over a lot of material. If I go to pages 30 and 31 of our text, um, there is something he says that, I, that is, is important, because as I've mentioned to you, Heidegger is constantly smuggling in his ideas about what, how we should think about the thing. And one of these is, uh, he talks about the, um, he says, well, can't we just get rid of these concepts, these, these three concepts of the thing, and just attend to what the thing is? And he says, well, in fact, that's the most difficult of tasks. And we might remember the very, the, the very opening when he started talking about the strength of thought. Um, how, how can we approach this most difficult uh, task, given, as he says, the resistance of the thing to our thinking? And there he's already suggested that in the thing in its very thingness is resisting thought. And he, and he invites us to entertain that resistance as a, as a trait of the thing. So it's not merely that you know, we're, we're not strong enough or not able enough in, in applying our concepts. He's saying there's something about a thing that actually resists thought. And it, again, he's, he's offering a sort of latent, or, uh, latent suggestion about what he's looking for in the notion of the thing. Um, how, do we, how can we just let the thing be, right, as he asks? And uh, how can we just let it, uh, let it be a thing? His way, as I said, is not to go straight to the question of the thing, but rather to go back into the matter-form relation and the issue of equipment and try to understand how, the, how to understand the equipmental being of equipment. And so he takes, um, he takes the example of Van Gogh, Van Gogh's shoes. And let's go find where that is. Um, here we are, page 32. <coughs> We choose, as an example, a common sort of equipment. A pair of peasant shoes. We do not even need to exhibit actual pieces of this sort of useful article in order to describe them. Everyone is acquainted with them. It's the most usual, the most familiar thing in the world. But since it is a matter here of direct description, it may be well to facilitate a visual realization of them. For this purpose, a pictorial representation suffices. We shall choose a well-known painting by Van Gogh. <laughs> Things are really starting now. You know, he did a number of paintings of shoes. Uh, and I don't know that anyone's ever quite identified which shoes are, are, are indicated here. Uh, there is a, an, a, there's a very famous exchange between Meyer Shapiro and Derrida. I don't know if Shapiro exchanged, but Derrida did. Um, <laughs> Meyer Shapiro wrote an attack on, on this, um, actually this little passage, um, saying that you know, this attribution, um, that when, when, when Heidegger attributes to Van Gogh um, the, the uh, I, I don't think I'm using that word attribution right, but when, when, when Heidegger identifies these as peasant shoes, um, he's, he's really doing something quite outrageous because anybody can see that these are workers' shoes. Um, the reference is, I'm sorry? Isn't it a woman's shoes? Well, that's the other question. You know, it's a woman's shoes or a man's shoes and so forth. Um, but basically, Meyer Shapiro is attacking um, Heidegger's sort of pastoral ideology and everything that goes with it. Right? And, uh, you know, he says this is really outrageous because um, these are not uh, uh, peasant uh, women's shoes and you know for working in the fields these these evoke an urban laborers context and uh, and Derrida comes back and says uh, well <laughs> I'm not even sure that these are uh, uh, 
we we don't have to do here with two left shoes. Um, it's you know, it's simply you know, and his um, hit the title of his essay. It's one of it's called La Vérité en Pointure, uh, Truth in Shoe Size, mm -hmm. and um, the the, uh, the 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 issue is precisely one of attribution and um, you know being able to um, identify the shoe in relation to the real world. So, uh, so I, I don't know if Maya Shapiro ever responded to Derrida. Does anybody know? Um, I thought he did, and then Derrida wrote the truth in painting. To Oh, weren't there two exchanges? I don't know. Yeah. That's what my, that's, and then to kill the, the uh, infinite conversation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. Anyway, yeah. it's a it's a very playful exchange, um, which you know, which is is Derrida is dealing with an ideologically motivated uh, critique, uh, or a critique that's trying to you know attack a particular ideology, but has its own ideological uh, baggage, um, and and he's trying to raise the question of representation. Um, Heidegger, of course, is himself raising the question of representation here by you know, um, very playfully because he starts out as, well, let's take a representation of shoes. But as he goes forward, he's going to undo any idea of representation. Is it, is it yes, what I, want to do, what I want to do is show you something that happens here. Yeah, page 32. Thank you. I know I knew where I was, I just didn't know where I was. And it's, um, so as I said, he starts out with um, more or less, it's, it's kind of a it's kind of a toss-off reference at this point. It's like we all know what shoes are, and he's playing with this sense of familiarity. Um, and then he goes on to say, "Okay, well, we we know what shoes are." In the next paragraph, uh, such statements only explicate what we already know. The equipmental quality of equipment consists in its usefulness, dienlichkeit, serviceability. But what about this usefulness itself? And somewhere in this, because I'm, I'm not using the German, he starts using a, he starts talking about Gebrauch usage, the way in which you use the shoes. In conceiving it, do we already conceive along with it the equipmental character of equipment? In order to succeed in doing this, must we not look out for the useful equipment in its use? And there I think he's talking about, he uses this word, gebrauch. The peasant woman wears her shoes in the field, only here are they what they are. They are all the more genuinely so, the less the woman, peasant woman thinks about the shoes while she's at work, or looks at them at all, or is even aware of them. She stands and walks in them. That is how shoes actually serve. It is in this process of the use of equipment that we must actually encounter the character of equipment. So serviceability, uh, usability, dienlichkeit, um, uh, and define the way in which the equipment is used. Um, and he goes on to say, well, in fact, um, you know, we're just talking about it in general, and Van Gogh's painting doesn't even tell us where the shoes stand. He says, I'm going on the next paragraph, there's nothing surrounding this pair of peasant shoes in or to which they might belong, only an undefined space. They are not, there are not even clods of soil from the field or the field path sticking to them, which would at least hint at their use. A pair of peasant shoes and nothing more. And yet. And then he goes into a whole riff of um, explicating what he sees or what is to be uh, apprehended or what is to be gained in, in the relation to this painting by Van Gogh. And he, again, he's staging this, uh, this movement for us. He is, he is, we've approached this as an illustration of shoes and an illustration of something with which all of us are already familiar. And his aim is to try to break that sense of familiarity. Right? Um, or he's trying to suggest Van Gogh's painting, despite all its, in sort of its emptiness, the, the shoes have an, an ill-defined background, you can't tell really much about them, in fact, and so on. Um, but he says, but nevertheless, in this painting, something is to be, um, is to, is to be grasped. And so, you know, he, he, he really he sort of stages for un doch, and yet, dash. And he goes into an entirely different mode of reading. And so it, it is, um, you know, he's playing out a little bit, um, he, uh, well, as he, as he will go on to tell us, he's not just, you know, uh, emoting in relation to the, um, to the painting at, the, at this point. It's not a matter simply of, you know, his feelings or what he imagines in relation to it. He says very explicitly as he goes on, the painting is speaking. And what, what we have to attend to is what we experience in this painting. So he's, and we'll come to this, I've, I've got it marked in my other book, but um, he starts insisting on the word erfahrung to talk about this relation to the painting. What's in this relation? 
Well, that paragraph, which is, can be extremely irritating in some respects, but it is, is very interesting in others. So let's, let, let me look at it with you. So, a pair of peasant shoes and nothing more. And yet, from the dark opening of the worn insides of the shoes, the toilsome tread of the workers stands forth. In the stiffly rugged heaviness of the shoes, there is the accumulated tenacity of our slow trudge through the far spreading and ever uniform furrows of the field swept by a raw wind. <laughs> On the leather lie the dampness and richness of the soil. Under the soles slides the loneliness of the field path as evening falls. In the shoes vibrates the silent call of the earth, its quiet gift of the ripening grain and its unexplained self-refusal in the fallow desolation of the wintry field. This equipment is pervaded by uncomplaining anxiety as to the certainty of bread, the wordless joy of having once more withstood want, and trembling before the impending childbed and shivering at the surrounding menace of death. This equipment belongs to the earth, and it is protected in the world of the peasant woman. From out of this protected belonging, the equipment itself rises to its resting within itself. Now, what is, you know, that, that's, that, that paragraph is charged in all sorts of ways, obviously. Um, but if you follow the, you know, the set of terms that are being offered, there are at least two sets of terms. One of them describes the woman's, uh, you might say, the existentials of this woman's life. Joy, anxiety, um, loneliness. loneliness, exactly, desolation, um, and so forth. A set, of, a set of terms which you know, don't belong to uh, the earth, but describe existence you know, in, in an earthly context. The other set of terms describes the earth, right? Richness, dampness, um, refusal, um, and so on and so forth. So what he is articulating in this paragraph is um, the peasant woman's experience of the relation between her world and the earth that is part of her world, or is inseparable from her existence in this world. And what he will go on to describe us now, to us now is the way in which the equipment is gathering these, these two relational structures into a single unity so that she is, by virtue of this equipment, and other equipment obviously, um, at home in her world. She puts on the shoes in the morning, she doesn't think about um, shoes as shoes. But she is, in some sense, bringing herself into this world, you know, putting on the shoes and thereby, uh, 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 I'm using the word fugin there, articulating, joining, bringing together. She's bringing herself into this world um, and into these relations. So equipment is in its, uh, and he'll introduce now the word reliability, um, the, the, um, the, um, the equipment is, 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 in a sense, gathering the relations of her existence as a worldly and earthly existence at the same time. And so he has here introduced, I don't know that this word appears uh, earlier in Heidegger's thinking. Um, you know, if you go back to being in time, you'll be familiar with all of this analysis of equipment. Um, when he describes a world, and I, now I might as well talk about world a little bit. When he describes a world, he says, um, any time we, uh, we are active in any context, when we, when we come into this classroom, um, when we go to work in, you know, on a farm or whatever, um, we immediately start working with the implements around us. You know, when we come into the classroom, we recognize these tables as desks, in some sense, places at which to sit in order to um, engage in the seminar. We don't worry about what a chair is when we come into the classroom. Right? We, know, we know what it is what a chair is. It has a function within a context um, which, is a, uh, which has been defined in advance. He says the chair has a, um, has a functionality relation. He has another word in it, um, which is escaping me suddenly, but and it, it, it has a function within a context. It has a signification within that context. When we interact in the world, we have always already cast for ourselves an order of significance uh, within which those things that we interact with um, have their place. They all, in some sense, refer to this context of relations as a significant context of relations. There's a kind of uh, referential character to every object within this relational whole. 
And of course the classroom relates to all the other dimensions of our life um, insofar as it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, articulated in some sort of functional whole. So this, this, um, this, this, well, this pragmatic whole, another way of talking about this is the pragmatics of existence, this pragmatic whole constitutes what Heidegger calls in this, in this earlier, in the 20s, the world. Uh, the world in, in which we always already exist. Because in, you know, in, order, in order to go to work, to be active, to engage others, the world must all already be given. So the, the world is something like the pragmatic a priori of, of, our, um, of our being. Uh, it's, it's already there, a priori, in that sense. And Heidegger says that we have, um, we, have we as a, you know, in a certain sense, when we, come, when we come to the world as children, we're learning about this pragmatic context. Um, but it is a function of our, of our um, you know, our language, our socio-historical situation. We, we acquire that functionality context. And you watch little kids, you see this going on all the time. Uh, we acquire that, we move into it, and, and, and we master it. I mean, you, you, said you, you said that we cast it for ourselves, but surely it's cast for us. It's cast for us, but then we are constantly recasting it. Yeah. So, um, you know, that the world is constantly sort of being redefined. And, um, you know, that, that, yeah. that whole of functionality is constantly, you know, there's a constant creative elaboration going on. So um, it is it is a human construct in that sense, the world. But it is uh, you know in, in, it is we have constructed it in advance in a sense. We have projected it in advance of, of any um, particular action. So the um, in that functionality whole, if, if we speak of this, you know, the world as a, as I said, a pragmatic a priori, um, we have understood everything as equipment. That's how he uses the term. Equipment in the sense that it is for some purpose, for the sake of our existing in the world. And, um, and so the, the, um, there is a serviceability, there is a usability, there is an availability. Um, and he talks about the different structures of that availability in, in being in time. Presence, presence at hand and, and so forth. But I don't remember him ever talking about Verlässlichkeit, um, this reliability. And I think it, it's, it, this term is only emerged because he's introduced the notion of the Earth at this point. And, and the Earth really is um, a development in his thinking um, at this point. I suspect that he's most influenced by Hilden in, 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 in this respect, but I'm not entirely sure. This, this, um, this powerful presence of the question of the Earth and this meditation on Earth, uh, on art, is a, is, a, is a real development in his thinking. Real, um, Real step. So the and I, and I think in some respects this is this is quite um, well, it's quite beautiful the way, way he introduces here. You know when he when he says that the what, what defines the essence of equipment is reliability, and that re reliability is the articulation of the relation between world and earth. It's what gathers these two into a um, a kind of unity, which makes it possible to say that we are at home in our world. The, the peasant woman doesn't worry about what shoes are. Uh, she might worry if the laces are broken, right? But then she deals with the broken laces. But she's not thinking about the function of the shoe. The, but the shoe is giving her the world as, a, or the way in which she's using the shoe, is giving her the world as a world in which she's familiar, and in a world in which she can move about um, with a certain comfort, with a certain security. Um, she's not, uh, you know, she, she, she's not paralyzed when she gets up in the morning. <laughs> And knowing how to how to proceed, it's it, there is the, the world is 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 already given and it's given as articulated with the earth in this particular site. So the Heidegger then points out to us, he's, you know, he says, um, well, you might think that we have uh, I've simply projected this this into um, Van Gogh's painting. I'm going to finish it just a moment. Um, you know, all of this is like an imaginative construct that I've invested in the work. He said, but no, um, what I'm doing, and, and if anything, this has been in, you know, it's not quite adequate. We need to go farther in relating, uh, just to, in, in relating to Van Gogh's painting. Um, and it's not that I have been imagining this into the painting. Rather, the painting, he says, speaks. And, and this is where he introduces the functioning or the working of art. Art is, art is doing something with these shoes that um, exceeds any simple representation. 
Obviously, if you just look at the shoes, you can't get out what he just got out of it in relation to the world and earth. So it's not a representation, a pictorial representation or an image. There is something else going on in, in the artistic presentation of these shoes. Yeah, yeah, finally, on the table. No, no, of course. Uh, thank you. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, I was going to ask this after class, because this is kind of embarrassing and uh, primary question, but uh, since you... <laughs> Where can you get a good pair of shoes? Right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> almost. Actually, almost every shop that's in it. Almost. Uh, peasant shoes. <laughs> almost. Uh, so forgive me if this is too simple and you can answer it later if, if you'd like. But, I mean, I, this, pa this paragraph, this paragraph of description, right? Uh, I don't know if this is a silly question. I understand there's two sets of, um, of uh, vocabulary that he uses and um, your explanation on equipment. And they blend into one another. Yeah, yeah. And, and your explanation of world and earth and equipment was perfectly, you know, I understood it. I just, I'm wondering how is it exactly, because I know he's trying to avoid the method physics of subjectivity. And I, um, I'm wondering, and I believe that he did, but I'm wondering exactly how is it that he does this here, because his description is so, it's almost poetic, it's so beautiful, and it, it feels like almost, it could be just his, you know, uh, his subject impression, his subjective impression on this painting. Yeah. So how is it that at the same time that he gives this beautiful description, is it not a subjective impression? Mm. How is it that you can claim, how is it that you can claim that every time those shoes, there's something about those shoes that will, will describe all of this, right? Yeah. I mean... Well, but, uh, can I just say something? Because that's apparently what Shapiro had a problem with, saying, how did he know those were women's shoes? Because there's a picture of what, anyway, except the origin of the painting, you don't know that, you know, they could be Van Gogh's shoes. So, like, I trust that Heidegger's brilliant and that he is avoiding the metaphysics of subjectivity. I just don't understand how he's doing this. I can right? think that well, it's total imagination. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's seeing into these shoes that, something that, that he imagines this romantic view of, of this woman and her trial. But that's and subjective. That. You know, and so I think that it takes a very different spin on, on the conversation. Like, why doesn't he talk about his own shoes? Like, it's something that he actually knows about. You know, and, and this is... I mean, it seems to be the shadow that it's subjective. Well, he's not talking about his own shoes because he wants to talk about art. And, uh, and I, no, but it's, that's absolutely critical here. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. It wasn't very stylish. <laughs> and that's it. But neither are those shoes. <laughs> no, it, no it, it, has to be, it has to be art here. That's, that's a, one critical thing. The other thing is, he's going to be very, I, I sympathize with you. I mean, there is, there's a kind of, a, you know, a display of imaginative uh, prowess. Prowess here, yeah. that's a good word. Um, here, but he's, he would be, he is elsewhere, very explicit. He's uneasy with the word imagination. Ein Bildungskraft. Um, Bildung is formation. Kraft is power. Ein Bildung, building in. You know, and that gets us to the impressing of, of form on matter. He, and, and of course this takes us back to Kant and the whole notion of schematism and the way in which we constitute the object, uh, the subject constitutes the object. So he's very nervous about the word imagination. That said, um, I'm giving you the philosophical, <laughs> but that said, you know, yes, I mean, there's, there's obviously a massive, you know, kind of investment here, that, uh, you know, on the part of his, uh, and this is, I think what he's doing, part of this is to say, well, yes, of course, we have to use our imagination, something like imagination, we have to let play, um, when we come to a thing, when, when we feel ourselves addressed by a thing, we have to, in a certain sense, answer that address, yeah. and this is, what he's, what he's enacting is preservation which we will describe in the latter part of the essay. He says, there is no working of an artwork without the one who receives it. Um, the, 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 art, the, the, the preserver's role is just as important as the artist's role. So uh, the truth that happens happens only in that relation. Yeah. The, 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 the art being um, received by the, uh, or only fully happens in that relation. The art being received by the, what he calls the preserver. Now, I have to agree. Still, I mean, there's, there's a lot of baggage in this paragraph. I mean, you know, it's it's, you know, it's, it's, very, it's very problematic in all sorts of ways. He really does have a pastoral ideology going on. You know, I mean, like, he was probably wearing lederhosen when he wrote this. Let's <laughs> 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 be honest. But but I think that he, on the one hand he's saying, on the one hand, I want to say yes to what he's saying about the use of imagination when we deal with with, with something like art. 
But also, I think what he really wants to bring out of this is, it's not, it's, this isn't an imagine, isn't simply an imaginative display of Heidegger's sensitivity with regard to things pastoral and, and woman and so on and so forth. No, what he's trying to say is that he, he's relating to the presence of a piece of equipment when it is truly equipment. That he seen, he's, what he's suggesting, he sees in Van Gogh's painting that Van Gogh has, has brought forth the being of these shoes as equipment. And what is that? Verlässlichkeit, reliability. And in reliability, there's a relation of world and earth. So he, he has, and in a sense, that's what he sees. And then he fills it for us, you know, with this, 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 this florid description. And then, but what he's seeing, what, I, what I'm trying to suggest is that he's suggesting to us that Van Gogh's painting has brought forward these shoes as somehow present to us in their equipmental character. It's not, you know, like he says, when we, later on when he talks about reliability, he says, when we come across a used up piece of equipment, which is no longer serviceable, no longer functioning, it's, there's something dead about it, right? We say something has disappeared from it, something is, is, is missing, it's, it's, a, um, it's, it's no longer serviceable. And that's, that takes us back to the discussion of the famous hammer in Being in Time, where he says, we don't relate to equipment as equipment unless it's broken. And then suddenly you say, What's with this hammer? You know, it's, it's the wrong size, the, whoever, whoever designed a hammer like this. And then we start to think about hammers. But it's only if the hammer is dysfunctional, in some sense. And then suddenly it falls away from us as equipment. We start to relate to it in a kind of theoretical way. We start to analyze what hammers should be, where the flaw is here, or how we have to fix this. And, um, and, and the equipmental context breaks, and it falls as a piece of equipment. And, you know, and you go through a play, you know, a junkyard or places, things, you know, things that are left over like that have a strange kind of presence. They're, they, you know, they are, they're not quite works of art, but they're also not equipment. They're in this strange sort of abandoned, um, sometimes dead looking, sometimes curiously, you know. But anyway, they have, they have, a, they have another status. And what Heidegger seems to be, I think he seems to be saying here is that Van Gogh has given us these shoes, that the shoes are brought to, forward to us, brought to us, I'm trying to evoke this idea of, presence and, yeah. <coughs> and truth and so forth. <clears throat> the shoes have been brought forward before us in a way that evokes their equipmental being, which he describes as reliability, because earth and world are somehow here, right? Yeah. And in a sense, I, I would say, that's all he's claiming. Um, and then he fills it, you know, with, with, uh, you know, with these existentials. Isn't Duchamp doing the same? Isn't I'm sorry? Isn't Duchamp doing the same with the ready-made? It occurred to me, yeah. Coffee has all... I, 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 I don't want to say yes because I don't feel strong enough for Duchamp, but I like your uh, suggestion. But, so to me, there's a, uh, yeah. a question. I, mean, I think that what bothers me about this, this whole piece, uh, every time I read it, is this sense of how the earth comes up as this equipmental thing in the end of it all. And he says later on how the earth rises up and it's never there and yada yada. And there's this. It's not equipment. No. But, but the way that he sees the separation of his self from these, these pieces of equipment that have the ability to then wear out and be left there, and it's you only question these things once they no longer service you, it shows that there is this, this understanding in his view that there are things that are meant to serve man. And in, in the reading of it and in the, the society that we live in and that we're living in the legacy of, the earth as such has been seen as a piece of equipment to use and it's only question now that it's becoming less reliable. And I think that there's, there's something in this fundamental separation that he creates that, that has these repercussions in kind of profound realms. And See, what, you know, what, 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 what you're saying is, is precisely the opposite of what he's trying to say. Now, you might be right, I'm not, I'm not dismissing what you're saying, but his whole point is to fight against what he calls technique, which is precisely that exploitation of earth. The, his, his effort is to delimit technique, to understand how this, how equipmentality in, in the order of technique entails this destruction of the earth. This, um, and the word he uses there is, it's no longer a use of the earth, it's a using up of the earth. It's, it's verbrauch, uh, uh, verbrauchen, instead of, uh, instead of uh, gebrauch, in the sense he's using here. So, I mean, the whole point of this analysis of equipment is to say that our um, understanding of equipment within the metaphysics of subjectivity as a st entailing a structure of production and, and our, you know, our productive relation to the earth, that entails a complete uh, occlusion, a, cl a complete repression of the earthly dimension of 
of our existence and, and allows us to imagine you know, that we are in some sense in control of this, of this process, when in fact uh, this process is in control of us. Um, so his, I, I mean, I don't, I, again, I don't want to say you're wrong. I mean, maybe, maybe he is in the grips of this in the way you're su suggesting, but his whole point is the opposite point. That, and, and that's what he's fighting for in this essay. He's saying, let us look, uh, art is going to let us look at equipment in a way we have never looked at it before, precisely in order to understand that in equipment there's a different use of the earth from what art reveals and from what the thing entails. And he says, we, don't, we, we, we can't even begin to approach what the thing is except through art. But we must, first of all, separate art from equipment, because otherwise we'll start using these categories of production, matter, form, etc., and thereby block our access to, to our earthly being. So I, I, I'm being very strong here because, in a sense, what you're suggesting is that, is that he's doing the opposite of what he's trying to do. As, uh, as he's manifestly saying. And so I'm trying to, uh, my point here in this lecture is to try to bring out what I think he's trying to say. And so I have to be strong in response. It's, it's the opposite. It, it, it really, the whole point is to grasp how to use the earth in a way that doesn't use up the earth, in a way that honors the earthly character of the earth and brings earth forward. And the, what, what it distinguishes the artwork from the piece of equipment is the piece of equipment absorbs the earth. Um, and, and, and actually, at one point, she says, it's not even clear we can use the word matter for equipment anymore. But, um, but anyway, in equipment, the, the material dimension of it ha has, been, has been so appropriated to the function that that materiality recedes from view and, and, and is, in effect, um, subsumed, you might say, in the concept of what the hammer is supposed to be or the house is supposed to be or whatever. And in art, on the other hand, the earthly component is brought forward. And so, the, um, in this description of equipment, it's interesting because he's now allowing us to see how Earth is in fact present in equipment. Mm -hmm. But it's only art that allows us to see that. Technique or technology suppresses that relation. But that's not where he's stopping. What, he, what he's saying, this has just been a whole staging of the, you know, the shoes in order to say what's really going on in art is the manifestation of the truth of the shoes. And then he's going, and that allows us then to relate to the earth in a way that would not be allowed within the metaphysical construct. So, just, <coughs> I'm sorry. sorry. Yeah. I, 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 you had a, a, a question? Yeah. No. Uh, well, all right. So I just wanted to finish up the thing about the metaphysics, just yeah, so it's, okay. if I understand it. So, like, <laughs> quickly, very quickly in B, right? Um, a. So, what I think what I understood from what you said, maybe I understood it wrong, but. The reason why it's not a just a, an evocation of subjectivity is because he only fills with existentials, what you call these dis descriptions, the, the shoe that's already been brought forth by the work of art. And so that's my first thing. And B... Um, because usefulness, reliability cannot be thought except in relation to those existentials and to those, dimension, those earthly dimensions. As right. soon as you have... The presence of being, the truth of the being of the shoes. Right. Those things are. And that is the job of the And that's then he starts to fill okay. it. And so the second thing is, um, so he's he's talking about a work of art uh, that that's this that's bringing forth an equipment on purpose then to show this difference between or is yeah, that totally. oh okay I this is all staged that's why I said it's, I a, it's a very performance so he like deliberately chose the shoe to. Differentiate between the equipment and absolutely, okay. and, it, and he deliberately chose it in an artwork in order to say, of course, this is not just an average pair of shoes. This is an art, and, yeah. and this is going to allow him to say, "Our whole beginning was misguided." So he's not talking about art, really. Yeah, he's talking about everything. Well, he's, yeah, but he's moving he's, toward art now. Yeah, he's moving toward art. Yeah, thank okay. you. What I really am compelled to do is do a kind of like schizo analysis here, um, with relation to a kind of intersubjectivity that's moving. Uh, with Heidegger and as in the work of art, um, chooses fun to play and go. And I think it's really astonishing in the way that he describes the shoes. Sure, he invests a ton, like peasant women's shoes, etc., which is his investment, but I feel like Van Gogh invests a lot in him when he says that, uh, he talks about the worldless joy of having once more withstood want and trembling before the impending childbed and shivering in the surrounding menace of death. I'm like, Get a drink, man. Like, yeah, you know, he, like, he's really like feeling Van Gogh there. I really feel like was that, that bad? That is like the movement of the work of art right there. That is like 
Van Gogh in him, like, just like, almost, fe- I want to say festering, like, the pain. That you know, I was suffering. just in New York at the Metropolitan looking at Van Gogh's portrait, self-portrait. <laughs> and under the hat, as a glow, you know, it's, it's on fire. Yeah. You know, like the, uh, like the, like the, um, uh, what do they call it, the, 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 the flowers that respond to the sun. You know. Um, that he was so interested in. And there's a but contempor- contemporaneity here, where Van Gogh becomes the contemporary of Heidegger. And they're together. Well, this is the, yeah, this is the creation-preservation the relation. Mm-hmm. And yeah. yes, there would be a, a, a question of, of being with Mitzan mm-hmm. involved here. So I, I, I don't know if it's a schizoanalysis, but there is certainly a, um, you know, a relationality at a, at a fundamental level. It's, it is Mitzan. It's also interesting to note that the tone of the language is totally different, and there is no other way to talk about that but in a poetic way. This is in reference to you. To me, it was more than the subjective. It's the language in which you can express how the shoes, sh- the shoeness of the shoesness of the shoe, comes out. It, the only way you can do it is poetically. I don't think this me- was meant to be an analysis. I mean, there could be a hundred yeah. other ways of understanding the possibility of a shoe being of a worker or whatever. That doesn't matter. It's how something comes forth, and there's no philosophical wording to that, unless you go to that other Yeah, and I think that that's another way of uh, saying, maybe it's an important part of what I was trying to say, this is preservation, not analysis. Yeah. It, and so, preservation in the sense of how we, how we react to the work of art. Um, and then, of course, in that reaction, you then begin to think, well, okay, Relation to death, mortality, joy. These are Stimmungen, These are you know all of this. These are existentials. We can do the philosophical riff. Uh, you know, I could I could go on for the next two hours just reading that paragraph you in relation could. to Heidegger's um, earlier thought. But the point is, I think you're very right that that you know that preservation in the realm of art is a very particular mode of, of relation, and it's not uh, necessarily separable from philosophy. But it, there are dimensions to preservation that are specific to the field of art. I think, I think that's you could say. It's that. philosophical, but it's not written in a philosophical. I mean, yeah, it's the language is not philosophical, although the the concept. Well, you know, the concept is not. The underneath is <laughs> philosophical. I would say it's philosophic. It's thinking and something more. And yeah, you know, but but it's it's told as the painting. He just translated it in his way to words. Yeah. But it's it's it's. The presence of the work of art is there in that paragraph. Yeah, yeah. So it's a transformation, but why couldn't he use, he couldn't use that term? Transformation. I mean, he shows it. It's more of a translation, because as he it's says, the painting speaks. Yeah, but and I mean, he's now brought it into another language. But he seems to transform his language into poetry, so he's exhibiting what he experienced in the work of art. But somehow he can't use this terminology. Or transformation because I think he wants us to, his real issue here is to point out to us that he's gone through the experience as opposed to, um, you know, Erfahrung rather than Erlebnis. But I really feel I should, we're starting to lose it here. So um, let's, let's take a break and um, 